Hello and welcome to the program Q&A. As usual on the program, we have our dear Dr. Grady McMurtry, all the way from America. So he's going to be dealing with a lot of uh, interesting questions. And I need to remind you that Dr. Grady uh, was an evolution scientist. Somewhere along the line, he switched over to join us in this kingdom where we believe in creationism. And we have him on the <laughs> on by Skype now. Good evening, Dr. Grady. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Good to see you, my brother. It's good to see you too. God bless you. It's been a long time since we, you know, since we hang out together. I remember in Surbiton in those days, going into fish and chips shops to just have a great time. I'm looking forward to hooking up with you again. Well, if we can ever get to England, we'll do it. You know? <laughs> First of all, you got to open the border. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's going to happen soon. I believe this year, things should start falling in place. Amen. Amen. And that's if China hasn't got any new surprises. Well, they certainly intended to hurt everybody. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> God bless you, sir. How was your Christmas holiday? Excellent. It was our it was our year to have uh, our family with us. We have to alternate uh, our Thanksgiving and Christmas every year wow. to give the other the other in laws a chance. You know, praise God. <laughs> well, to, to start off, I met a guy who says he's an evolutionist, and I'm I, I'm sure he's watching tonight. And so many others who haven't seen you here before, they probably be watching you for the first time. But my first question to you is. You know, how did you switch over from being an evolution scientist to being a creation scientist? Well, of course, it was a process. And very few people go from evolution to creation instantaneously. Uh, in my case, uh, I was a trained evolutionist, raised as an evolutionist, earned my science degrees as an evolutionist. But as a good scientist does, I continued to search for truth. And at the age of 27... I decided to decide for myself whether Jesus was telling the truth or not, because, of course, uh, particularly at my age, it would be impossible to grow up in the United States, late 40s, 50s, 60s, without knowing about Christianity. Now, that didn't make you a Christian, but you certainly knew about the claims of Christianity. And as an evolutionist and in a search for truth, I decided to decide for myself whether Jesus was telling the truth or not, because if he was I needed to change, and if he was not, I needed to move on to something else. And so I spent 16 months taking a look at the question of concerning creation evolution after becoming a Christian. Now, it took me six months to determine that Jesus was telling the truth. I accepted it, and then for 16 months I asked the question, did God use an evolutionary process to create what we see around us today? Or was what I had learned and taught others incorrect, and that God really had spoken everything into existence in six literal 24-hour days, roughly 6,000 years ago? So I took a look at natural process, the physical evidence, scientific law, and after 16 months came to the conclusion that there is absolutely no scientific evidence for evolution whatsoever. And that does not mean that organisms don't change over time, but that's not evolution. That's simply the recombination of previously existing information. But there is no such thing as progressive upward increase in intelligence or complexity by random chance. And the last question I asked myself at the end of 16 months was, could the law of gravity ever evolve? Uh, gravity is a universal force in nature, uh, one of the few absolute constants in nature. And, of course, the conclusion is it could not possibly have evolved from something less. It had to come to, into existence whole and complete. And if it came into existence whole and complete, it had to be created. And instantaneously, you realize that all scientific laws, and I don't care whether it's the laws of motion, uh, the heat laws, whatever, all of them had to come into existence, created whole and complete. They could not possibly have been something less. And again, no natural process is of any value unless it's whole and complete. And I would cite photosynthesis as a universal example of that. You take out one step, it doesn't work. So it could not have evolved into existence from a lesser process. And I was growing up looking at the physical evidence. I, I grew up as an evolutionist in the paleontology labs at Cal Berkeley. And I knew 
the evidence, but what I didn't realize was that I had been lied to, I had been censured from seeing the evidence that's really in the ground, meaning that while there are layers in the ground, there's fossils in the ground, the layers are not in the order shown in the textbook. There are many discrepancies all over the world, including upside down mountain ranges, according to the evolutionary method of dating, that we have polystrate fossils, other things that are inconsistent with the what's called historical view of geology taught in England and the United States. Um, and in fact, flood geology, which is the biblical approach to geology and paleontology, is a much better way of looking at what we find in the ground. And so I became a biblical scientific creationist, believing that everything was created in six literal 24-hour days about 6,000 years ago, whole, complete, perfect. And because of human sin, has been generating ever since. Praise God. Thank God for your life. And you know, <laughs> a lot of times when I watch some documentaries on TV, you hear some so-called scientists say, oh, this material evolved billions of years ago. That animal evolved three billions, year, billions of years ago. And I cringe. And some of these guys say they are Christians. So to me, it seems like, you know, if you, if you believe in that ideology, then that, it would be hard for you to, it's like telling, telling God that God is not powerful enough to create all he did in six days. Well, any Christian who certainly has accepted Jesus as Lord, uh, Savior, but believes in an evolutionary process, uh, unfortunately, they are ignorant of facts they're lacking in faith, because they believe in a weak God, not the God that you and I know, not El Shaddai, not the Almighty God not the one who is totally sovereign in all things, who can speak and things happen because he is sovereign. They believe in a weak God who doesn't know it all, who has to experiment, has to turn a wrench here and a screwdriver there and learn over time, uh, would use a cruel process of death to create what we see around us today. They believe that things uh, in an evolutionary sense started simple and became more complex over time through a cruel process, whereas we believe that everything started off perfect, that everything existed prior to sin entering into the universe and therefore death entering into the universe, as it says in Romans 5.12. Um, and so we have a very different view of Scripture. Uh, you and I consider Scripture as inerrant. Uh, they believe in a weak God, and they are lacking in faith and they are lacking in knowledge of the science that contradicts evolution. Wow. Praise God. Thank you so much for that. And you know, you have a lot of fans on this station. The questions are coming in thick and fast. But before you go to those questions, just one other thing I need to throw in. I did a program recently on the Flat Earth Movement. What well, can you <laughs> tell us about those guys? And they say they are Christians as well. <laughs> I find it remarkable that any serious, sane person would believe the Earth is flat. Um, and the truth of the matter is, we've known the Earth is round since the creation. Uh, the Greeks proved it was round 2,300 years ago. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of evidence for that. And I never thought that anybody really believed it. Um, of course, in the United States, it was taught because of a work of fiction by a fiction author named Washington Irving. He's the same man that wrote the, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. He was not a Christian. As a matter of fact, he was an anti-Christian. Uh, and he wrote a false story about Columbus, which was not based in truth. And that uh, in his story, Columbus was told the earth was flat and he'd fall off. Uh, that story is absolutely not true. It's not based in historical writings whatsoever. Uh, everybody knew the Earth was round in 1492. Uh, scientists in Europe knew the size of the Earth. The argument was not, was the Earth flat? The argument was our ships are too small to carry enough supplies to get all the way from Europe to India by sailing west, which is what, what he was trying to do. Okay. Um, and he had sailed past the point of no return. Now, he had gotten to a point where he was about to run out of supplies when he suddenly found out that there were two continents in the way. 
however, just to address this thing, we can't go through all of it, but uh, a year ago, I wrote a very extensive article that is available for free on my website at creationworldview.org. And um, I address basically any and every argument used currently by people who are trying to promote the concept of a flat earth and show that it's not true. Thank you. Now, uh, I know on the banners they're not showing creationworldview.org, but just for everybody who can write it down, creationworldview.org, go to the articles page, look up flat earth, that's all you have to do. There's a search engine there. It'll take you to this very extensive article. And I would point out just one of the fallacies, if I might, which is that according to the flat earth people, um, there is no such thing as gravity. Yep. And they, and they say that the reason that we have the effect of gravity, that is you and I are held down on the ground, is because the earth is accelerating at the value of gravity. So that supposedly the earth is accelerating at 1G. So we feel the force of gravity, but it's not actually gravity. And as I point out, that means that the Earth would have to continue to accelerate at 1G on a continuous basis, which means that today the Earth would have to be moving at the speed of light. Wow, that's serious. And, yes, uh, sir. <laughs> and you know, they got to deny also that you know, we have uh, spacecrafts traveling all the way to Mars and the other planetary systems with the information we receive on a daily basis. Well, you see, they deny that. They say the pictures are faked, the moon landing was faked. They say that the sun and the moon are only 3,000 miles away, circling, uh, chasing each other, so to speak, uh, above a flat Earth. Um, it, there's, there's so many things that are false about it, so many scientific untruths. And the pastors, and I hate to say this, but there are pastors who have, no, in, in England, in Russia, in Brazil, United States, uh, the areas that I work in, uh, who are promoting this and saying it's biblical, and it is absolutely not biblical. Um, you know, the Bible uses what we refer to as phenomenal language, and the word phenomenal there means that many of the observations written in Scripture are describing phenomena as seen by a person standing on the earth. You know, when you stand on the earth, you see the sun and the moon rise in the east and set in the west, as we call it. Um, and so uh, that's the way it's described, is the phenomena as you're viewing it from the surface. But the truth is the earth is rotating, and that's what makes it appear that way, correct? Yeah. And, and so they're taking this phenomenal language in the scripture, though accurate, but they're then twisting it to support a false concept. Wow. Could there be a spiritual force behind this deception? Well, I would say yes, because what it really does is it brings Christ and Christianity into ridicule by the rest of the world. Wow. Because when Christians say things like that, the rest of the world says, well, that's not true. You know, you've got to be kidding. And when that happens, then it would be reasons for people not to believe. Wow. Thank you so much for that. Uh, well, there's a question. There's some questions here from a gentleman by the name Steve. He says, uh, good evening, Yemi and Dr. Grady. Could you please clarify the following? Genesis chapter 4, verse 14 we have heard about four people so far after creation, Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. Why was, uh, question number one, why was Cain worried about being killed by others? Were there other people alive on earth? Question number two is to do with Genesis chapter four, verse 17. Where did Cain get his wife? Was she his sister or niece? Many thanks and God bless you. A common question, and Steve, uh, let's address that. First of all, while the men are named, except for Eve, uh, please take a look at chapter 5 of Genesis. Now, in chapter 5 of Genesis, um, particularly starting to say verse 3, Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness named Seth. So that's the third son that's named. And he's the son that Eve talks about who replaces Abel, who was slain by Cain. 
But when you read the next verse, it says in verse 4, the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters. And other translations say many sons and daughters. Now, you have to remember that God only created two people. That's Adam and Eve. And he told them that their purpose was twofold. Number one, they were to have a relationship with God directly and worship him, love him for who he is, not what he does. And number two, that they were to procreate and fill the earth. Now, while we only have three sons that are specifically named, it says that he had many other sons and daughters. And Cain married his sister. There was nothing wrong with this whatsoever. It was not sinful in any way. First of all, there was no alternative. Secondly, the law against incest did not exist until the time of Moses. Even Abraham married his half-sister by blood. But at the time of Moses, God knows that if close relatives continue to uh, marry and have children, that will suffer genetic diseases. And so in order to prevent genetic disease, God commands through Moses that they are no longer to marry their close relatives. And this was to prevent pain and suffering. And the law against incest is not a sin law. It is a health law. Praise God. Brilliant. Another one here from a lady called Joan in Ireland. Say, Happy New Year to you. In Ireland, we are in stage five of lockdown. The government said they are expecting 6,000 a day. I don't know whether 6,000 a day to die or be infected. I, 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 absolute fear, mongering, and lies. It con, it's control and communism. And anyone who voices their opinions are silenced. If we don't take the vaccine, we will be arrested and put into detention camps. God help us. Do you, you think well, that's the way to go? That's the way the government is going across the world. Well, the fact of the matter is that COVID has become the hammer of the left. COVID is the all-purpose reason to enforce socialism, which means to enforce communism. There, socialism is only a step. Nobody ever stops at socialism. Lenin said that socialism was merely a stop along the road to get to communism. The fact of the matter is they're not locking down for health reasons. They're locking up to promote communism, period. Now, I have told the truth about COVID on this program and I'm just stating facts that were brought out by our own CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and talked about it on our TV. The snippet was placed on YouTube and taken down by YouTube with a warning never to do that again or you'd be eliminated from YouTube for a week. Why? Because it didn't fit their political agenda. Now, as far as taking the vaccine, I think that's a personal decision that you need to make for yourself. I don't think you should be forced to do it, but by the same token, I have said that there is no reason not to either. Uh, it's safe, as far as we know. Now, I simply point out that COVID is being used as the big hammer from the left to enforce communism, control over everybody's lives. This includes the thought police. Because here, even in the United States, there are governors who want to arrest you for negative thoughts about this, this lockup process um, in your own home. Now, if that's not 1984, I don't know what it is. Wow. Well, we've got to keep praying and pray that the right people get into position of authority to make sure we don't get messed up in the end. Um, there's uh, one here from a gentleman called Ex Labor Dave. He, said, <laughs> he, he says, hi, folk. We know that God created everything. We know that other intelligent life does not exist. Or does it? Is it possible that other life forms could be out there? And is, is it possible that they are? Could, they could, have, could have evolved into aliens with intelligence. There's nothing in the Bible to say one way or the other that other life forms do not or do exist. Only humans, according to scriptures. What do you think, sir? Actually, the Bible does tell us specifically there is no alien life form anywhere else. That is to say, there are no sentient beings any place else that could sin and uh, receive salvation. The Bible is very specific about it. If you go to Psalm 139, it says that this is the only place where there are people, the only place where there are creatures who 
can experience sin and be saved. In the New Testament, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ came here and died once for all. Now, when God says all, he means all. If there were alien beings someplace else that could experience salvation, then God would not have used the word all. And Jesus would have to have gone to each and every one of these supposed planets and died for them there. And so the Bible is specific about that. The Bible is, however, silent when it comes to plants and animals. Now, the Bible does say that God decorates the universe for his own good pleasure. So if God wants to create other planets, and I would point out that we do know of over 4,000 other planets outside of the solar system right now, uh, an indicator that there may be millions of planets in the universe. However, not one of them is capable of supporting life uh, in any way, shape, or form that we know of. But if God wants to create planets somewhere, even if it's in another galaxy, and it has the, the you know, Goldilocks abilities of being in the right place for heat, light, cold, etc., cetera, um, and he wants to put plants and animals there, that's his business. And the Bible doesn't say. But there are no beings like us, intelligent, sentient beings, that can, in fact, um, sin and experience salvation. But how, you know, how do you describe these UFO sightings that uh, were released from the American government classified uh, information and the department? Frankly, I know there's been an awful lot of news lately about UFOs, but I'm pointing out to you that there are no alien beings of any kind. That's scripture. Okay. Now, Let's, let's, let's go a little further, though. What are UFOs and aliens uh, that have been supposedly seen by people? You know, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who claim to have seen uh, UFOs flying through the sky or they have claimed to see you know, alien beings. Now, let's be frank. You and I both know 99% of those are drug-induced, uh, crowd hysteria, uh, people wanting to draw attention to themselves, whatever it is and are not real. But the 1%, the 1% who actually saw something, saw something. The question is, what did they see? Now, the Bible tells us that God's angels can take the form of human men in order to communicate with us, such as in the, the case of Lot, for instance. Now, that being the case, if God's angels can take the form of human men, and I would point out they never take the form of women. They always take the form of men then the satanic angels can also transform into what we would think of as alien beings. And if they can do that, they can also transform themselves into uh, the shape of alien spacecraft, whatever. Um, and so what you're really seeing here is demonic activity, where they are, are either appearing as aliens to deceive people who are willingly deceived, or they appear, for instance, as the shape of spacecraft, uh, I mean, think about some of the UFO sightings. They've said, oh, I saw this spaceship crossing the Arizona sky uh, at incredibly high speeds and make a 90-degree turn without, you know, just a flat 90-degree angle, no curve whatsoever, and travel in another direction. Now, that would break every law in physics, but it would break no law in the supernatural. Yeah. That's, that's heavy. I agree with you, sir. Uh, a, a sister called Amanda from Bel Belfast says, what do you think of the mirror pillars that are appearing in different countries? <laughs> <laughs> That's human activity. <laughs> <laughs> people put them there and people made them disappear and we've even got proof of that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Another quick one from a sister called Veronica. She says, uh, hi, Dr. Grady and Brother Yemi. Might we know why Dr. Grady advocates COVID-19 vaccine? Does he have shares in the Bill Gates Foundation? After what Bill Gates and Judge Soros stand for, which is depopulation, why should we trust anything they're selling to us, even if it's for free at the point of getting it? We know they get paid by the government. Why should we trust that they care about humanity when some vaccinations that Bill Gates provided for in Africa are causing many diseases and making women infertile, a measure of population control? What do you think, sir? 
Well, first of all, of course, I totally disagree with George Soros and Bill Gates both. I'm a 180 degrees opposite of their opinion about things. And I'm not promoting that everybody has to get the COVID vaccine. What I was pointing out was there's no reason to believe that it isn't safe to take it. But I still believe that it's a matter of personal conscience whether you do or not. That was all that I said. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I, I personally, I just believe that since it takes years to actually prepare the, any vaccine and you have something like this rush through, I just, as a point, as a, you know, as a caution, I just thought, well, let's see how it plays out. Because we've seen in the past when women took the morning after pill and it was just years later before we saw the terrible effect it had on them and their babies. Well, and, and again, I agree with that. However, I, I would point out that while generally speaking, it will take in the areas of four or five years to develop most vaccines in the past, that what you've seen is what capitalism can do if it's unrestricted by government regulations, or at least where the regulations have been loosened, and that government is actually promoting the activity rather than trying to restrict the activity. And so the ability to get a vaccine within nine, 10 months actually just proves what humans are capable of doing when, when government gets out of the way. So I, I understand the hesitancy. I agree we need to be taking a look at the long term. The thing is that we have given this vaccine to hundreds of thousands of people without any detriment except those who turned out to be having an allergic reaction. But these are people that shouldn't have taken it in the first place and knew that they had allergies. Um, my own wife may not take it for the very same reason she may. We have yet to determine that um, on the basis of her, her doctor's opinion. Um, I'm certainly in an age where I could take it, but I'm so healthy. I want to make sure that other people get it first. I'm not running out and trying to get it myself right now. <laughs> right. So healthy people get it first and then, you know, others can come later. Well, you know, nothing, nothing in the lab can right. give us what's going to be a five-year effect of this. So let me ask the question. We have what appear to be effective vaccines. We have several of them uh, using a couple of different, though similar, methods. Uh, we have tested it on hundreds of thousands of people before it was made out to the public. Um, and these are short-term results. I, I agree with that scientific. However, are we willing to wait five years to see what the long-term results are and have millions of people die, or are we willing to take it now based on what we know? Because we all make decisions with incomplete information. That's right. Wonderful. I, I was explaining to a lot of people that it's true we have uh, Bill Gates talking about, you know, the whole world population being so, being so high. And then this, this same person, is now, who is not a, is not a doctor, he's a computer scientist, is now trying to sell some vaccine to the world. That's why some people are a bit, you know, skeptical about uh, Bill Gates I, himself. I, I can understand that. I, I, however, think that the skepticism should be placed on the media. Okay. And by that, what I mean is this. Um, I, I wish they would stop announcing the number of new cases that have been found. Yeah. Because the number of new cases that have been found is absolutely irrelevant. It doesn't matter how many new cases are found. Um, as a matter of fact, our grandson uh, was just here for Christmas and he went home and was tested for COVID as was required by the Maryland state law and found out he had antibodies for 19, but he'd never been symptomatic. Okay. Uh, so the point is, if you keep testing, you're going to keep finding new cases, but that's irrelevant. The th important thing is that only 10% of people who test positive will be hospitalized. Of the total number that, in fact, are positive, and, and again, there's false positives, there's also false negatives, um, but but nonetheless, those that have been tested positive, we're talking about roughly one half of 1% uh, will actually have serious illness and may die from it. But then again, people will die every day, every second from something. And typically those who die that have COVID 
at the time of death didn't die from COVID. What they actually died from was other things that they had at the time. Um, it, not just pneumonia, but they may have had the flu at the same time that they got COVID because you can have both at the same time. Uh, but they were dying from things like heart attacks, aneurysms, other conditions, um, and they just happened to have COVID at the time. Uh, there's a big, big movement right now to do an audit on this because the CDC here in the United States says that only six-tenths of one percent of the people who die coded with COVID actually died only from COVID. Wow, wow, wow. I, I just think something needs to be done. Like you said, the media are, are pushing this heavy uh, narrative that's putting fear in people. Um, and there's someone just wrote in called Jay, and the person goes, good evening, doctor. Uh, do you believe that the new strain of virus is real or not? And if yes, why is this stronger? Was it manipulated? Well, first of all, there's actually two new strains of the virus that have been found, not just one. One, one has made news. The second one was just found. But viruses mutate all the time. That's why every year you have to have a flu shot for the new strains of mutated viruses that come around. And I would remind everybody that the flu shots that we get in the fall are typically only about 50% effective versus the COVID-19, which can be apparently up to 95% effective, depending upon which one we're talking about. Um, but viruses mutate. They, they're rampant mutators. Now, the second strain that was found recently appears to be more infectious, but it doesn't make it any more deadly. And a third variant now has been discovered as well. So the same thing is true of flu. It happens every year. What we need to do is do what people do best, and that is to adapt to the situation that we have at the moment. Um, we, we have so many emails here. This is incredible. I don't know how we're going to get through with tonight. Uh, well, through them, there's, there's a lot. Okay, someone asked a question here. It says, hi, Yemi and Grady. How many years are there in a generation according to the Bible? Keep shining bright, guys. And as Frankie in Belfast. Well, Frankie, that's a, an interesting question with multiple answers. Because in the Bible, we find at times a generation is 30 years, 35 years, 40 years, and in one case, 120 and so the word generation is a little flexible in the Bible. And of course, today, a generation, you're lucky if it's 20. But in the past, generally speaking, we've used 30 or 40 years as a normative for a generation. Vaccines for COVID. I, I, this is from a lady called June Simpson. She has a, a quest, so many questions here. Says Dr. Grady, hello. I hope all is well in Florida. There is a series of questions about the Pfizer uh, biotech vaccination. I'm wondering if you have any info about these. Dr. Shukaris Bakdi, viro viro virologist of Germany, says there are four concern concerns about the Pfizer vaccine. One, the tests were only done on young, healthy adults with no other illnesses, with about half of the tests subjects out of about half of the test subjects suffering side effects we do not know the effects on the elderly or uh, elderly with underlying health concerns these are the people group most likely to die from covid-19 question number 2 it says the vaccination is composed of several components and encapsulating them is uh, mrna which can cause serious uh, allergic reactions. It is a gene alter it is a gene altering vaccine. Do you know what this means? Dr. Bagdi says this vaccine is totally different from the flu. Well, yeah. Let's let's just stop because okay. uh, we've gone over this list many times on our TV before, Emmy. Okay. Um, okay. And there's an awful lot of false information going around on the internet. And I think people need to stop first of all and think about this. Half of what's on the internet isn't true. That's the first place. Yeah. Secondly, yes, R and the RNA is involved here with these vaccines. That's what they're based on. And mRNA is just messenger RNA for the clarification of those that are listening. 
And some of these vaccines use lipids to encase this uh, material uh, in order to get it into the cells where it can then be used. That's all true. Now, the fact of the matter is there's nothing in these vaccines that reaches the magnitude of being able to change your DNA uh, as we know it at this time anyway. Uh, what we are doing here is the RNA is used to simply activate the cells uh, mechanism to draw the body's attention to generate antibodies that will kill the virus. Uh, it's simply another way of doing it versus the older methods that we've been using. Now, this, and I'm assuming that, you know, these companies are being honest about what they're doing. After all, uh, these companies, if they didn't do it right, if they didn't do the tests that they said they had run, uh, would simply then close. They would be losing billions and billions of dollars. They have a vested interest in making sure that these things are effective. Now, nobody will say that somebody can't do something that's criminal somewhere along the lines, but the, the pharmaceutical companies are reputable. The tests are reputable. The materials that are being used, you know, there, there are people who are saying, oh, it has this, that, or the other thing in it that will hurt you. The fact of the matter is the very minute, and I'm talking about very minute quantities of things that are in these vaccines are less, and I'm not talking about the RNA, but I'm talking about the other things that are with it, are less than you would get by eating food every day. Thank you so much for that. Uh Another quick question here it says, uh, can you ask Dr. Grady, why did only the sun and the moon stand still instead of the earth? If the earth is moving, which is mentioned in Joshua chapter 10, let God be true and man be a liar. Well, we also have to include the shadow going backwards on the wall with Hezekiah. So there's two events of particular note. Now the sun and the moon stayed in position uh, when we have the time of Joshua. However, we've discussed this many, many times on the program. The fact of the matter is that the Earth continued to rotate. It did not stop. That the sun and the moon appearing to stay stationary is a local miracle by God. It is not recorded anywhere else by any other astronomers in the world. And there were good astronomers in China, India, Egypt, uh, South America, that if the Earth had actually stopped, and then started again, they would have recorded the same event, but they did not. So this is a local miracle that God provided. Now, he is the light giver. He can create light. He doesn't need the sun, the moon, the stars to do it. The sun and the moon are referred to specifically because they are the ones that provide enough light for the battle to continue. You know, if you take a night where there is no, no moon whatsoever, it's so dark you couldn't do that. And so starlight is not enough. Therefore, the sun and the moon were the important objects that appeared to stay. Now, whether the stars appeared to stop or not is irrelevant because the text doesn't say so. Fantastic. I thank God for your life. I agree with you on that because about two years ago in Nigeria, a preacher of righteousness died and his messages are on YouTube. And the day he was buried, the sun took it a different shape in the sky suddenly. Everyone saw it, it was filmed, but it was a localized you know, phenomenon, and it was, it was incredible. Right. Yeah, think about it, if, this, if the Earth had actually stopped, uh, we'd have all died. You and I wouldn't even be here. Uh, and again, the same thing with Hezekiah. The shadow goes backwards and then forwards again. So the Earth would have to stop, go back, stop, go forward. Uh, if that were true, all life on Earth would have been destroyed. Uh, these are simply local phenomena that God, as the light giver, can make these things appear to happen and become visible to us. But the earth never stopped rotating. Praise God. Um, someone, uh, a gentleman by the name Duncan from Inverness says, as a civil engineer, when building a North Sea jacket, we had to allow for the earth's curvature, otherwise the wells would not be the correct size and cost a fortune. Believe in the Bible and know the truth. God's richest blessings to you all at Revelation TV. And bless you, my Scottish brother. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Um, um, another one here from someone, a lady called Linda. 
She says, a very happy new year to you and your viewers. My question to Dr. Grady is, when Jesus was in the garden before his crucifixion, do you understand the word like to mean similar to when it, when it was written? He sweat, he sweat droplets like blood. Thank you for your live programs. Very important. God bless you all. That, that's a really intriguing question because, uh, as I point out, there are times when you read the word like in the Bible, and it means similar. And you should always substitute the word similar for is like in literature to get the right understanding in most cases. However, in the garden, uh, that's another question entirely. Remember that Jesus was under tremendous trauma facing the cross, knowing what was in front of him. And he is going to have to bear the sins of the entire world. You, you can't even imagine, shall we say, the pressure that was on him. Now, he looked forward to it. We're told that when he was up in Capernaum. Um, and he was going to do it regardless of what was going on. But in his humanity, nonetheless, he's facing this turmoil too. Now, under extreme duress, there are little muscles in the skin. Now, you know about goosebumps. Yeah. And so when you get cold, you know, a chill, quick chill, you get these goosebumps. And so there's yeah. muscles in the skin that cause the skin to draw up into these goosebumps, correct? Yep. Now, under enough duress, we do know of a few cases where the muscles have contracted to the point that it actually tears little capillaries in the skin and little drops of blood will come to the top. I suspect that that's what occurred in the garden. Now, for instance, uh, later in the New Testament, when it says that uh, with the Lord, a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a year uh, uh, to him, it's talking about his long suffering ability. But there is like should be read similar, not equal. But in the garden, uh, I think that's different. I think that he literally did um, not sweat blood, but that these little capillaries in the skin were broken by the muscles of his intense prayer, and that little drops of blood actually did come to the surface. Now, not, not sweating blood, but little drops of blood being visible due to the little tears in the capillaries. Praise God. Well, sometimes you hear people say his eyes were red like fire. So it doesn't mean fire was coming out of the eyes, but very red. And, but again, God is a perfect author. Uh, and as a perfect author, God uses metaphor, simile, parable, analogy, and we could not do those things if he did not do them first. You know, yeah. we can't do anything that God didn't do or have the capacity to do. Uh, he created us with these abilities because he has those abilities. And so, you know, the, the, the eyes like fire, that's, that's just a literary device. Um, and I'm simply pointing out that in the garden, though, I think there's actually a medical basis for it. Praise God. Another a gentleman by the name Chris says, hi, hi, guys. Have you heard about the Great Reset? Could the lockdown be leading us to that? God bless you. <laughs> oh, gracious, yes. The Great Reset. We hear about it all the time. And the fact of the matter is, uh, the Great Reset is simply another terminology for the communist attempt to enforce communism on the world. Um, you know, people don't really understand it. Uh, I, I hate to say this because, of course, the program originates in the UK, but the UK has a serious case of socialism. Um, but I have lived in true communist countries uh, in my mission work. And if you think things are bad now, just wait, because if the, the, this big reset really occurs, it's going to go from socialism straight into communism, at which point everything in your life is going to be judged based upon whether you support an atheistic government or not. And communism is really simply a religion in co contrast to Christianity. They are attempting to simply eliminate Christianity. I agree with you because uh, that's why the church in China has to be in, on, in the underground because they hate communism and socialism don't like freedom. They want you to just obey and follow. And those are ideologies that can only be implemented by force. 
And take a look at the United States politics, where the big reset and so forth is a major factor right now. Uh, Biden and Harris are both anti-Christian, which is strange because Biden claims to be a Catholic. But, of course, he cannot receive communion because of his stance on abortion. But Harris has openly opposed Christianity flat out. doesn't matter what flavor it is. But the question is, why would Christians, practicing Christians, vote for people like that? Because, unfortunately, Christians can be deceived just as much as anybody else can be. Wow. You know, there are people who, who claim Christianity, go to church, and I, I hate to bring it up, but there is a, a supposed pastor. Uh, I, I, Sorry, I can't agree with the term here, but a supposed pastor running for Senate in the state of Georgia right now who, who openly preaches in favor of abortion, and yet abortion is what was used to try to reduce and eliminate the black race, and he's black. That's very sad. I, I, I understand what you're saying. I've always said it. I said <laughs> abortion is just a, it, it's a tool being used to co control the population and keep a particular race down. And unfortunately, the particular race are still blinded to the fact that this is the agenda of the Democratic Party that voted God of their platform. Well, that's just it. The Democratic platform, I, if you read it, no Christian could vote for it, not, not and, and believe in the laws of God and in his ordinances, um, which is against abortion. Uh, Sanger was uh, simply founding Planned Parenthood to eliminate the black race. And so here's a supposed black creature promoting abortion, which is eliminating his own race as he sees it. Now, I don't believe there's any such thing as different human races. I think you and I are exactly the same color. I think we're exactly the same race. Um, you and I are the same color. You've just got more of it than I do. But, okay, God blessed you with more than me. So what? Amen. Praise God. Uh, another one here from a lady called Julie Gillingham. Uh, um, it says, hello, Yemi and Dr. Grady. How did the population cope with, Spanish, with the Spanish flu and, we are, and were there locked down then? Many blessings. Well, again, I think we can make two points here. Number one, they did what I said earlier. We adapted. We lost people. We lost a lot of people. But pandemics have occurred throughout human history. The first written pandemic that we know of that we can document outside of the Bible was in Athens nearly 500 years before Christ. So, so pandemics, epidemics have been around because we're humans, we get sick and we die. Uh, in 1917, 1918, uh, 100 million plus people died in the world. And, that, and that's a great tragedy. Don't get me wrong here. But what really stopped it, in essence, was herd immunity, which we've talked about many times over the last year. But I want to point out a second thing. Spanish flu didn't go away. Now, first of all, it was not correctly named. It had nothing to do with Spain, so I want to make that clear. Um, but do you know the last time Spanish flu was actually diagnosed? Nope. Okay, well, the big epidemic was in 1917, 1918, and then it basically went away, right? That's right. Okay, but when was the last time a case of Spanish flu was diagnosed? Never heard of it this time around. Yeah, you haven't heard about it since 1918, is that right? Sure. Funny thing, though, the last case that was diagnosed was about 15 years ago. Okay. My point is, viruses exist in the environment. Now, because of herd immunity, because of other things, including vaccines and so on, uh, the number goes way down. But that doesn't mean it became extinct. And the last case we know of, which would indicate that the virus itself became extinct, was about 15 years ago. You know, bubonic plague comes around every so often and has for centuries and centuries. Bubonic plague has never been cured. It has never been eliminated. Wow. So what, that, that is heavy. So it seems, but the, the problem here is that some people believe that the uh, current coronavirus we have was actually 
to do with uh, uh, germ warfare that escaped from uh, some laboratory in China. Well, even recently, the Chinese admitted that it came out of a lab. You know, just this past week, they finally admitted it wasn't the wet market, it was a lab. Now, because this is a communist government, number one, they don't care about people. Communists do not care about people, in spite of everything they say about how we're going to make things better for everybody. All they do is give equal misery to everybody except themselves. The communist elitists live very well, but everybody else lives just by groveling, basically. So number one, they didn't care about people. Number two, I believe that, uh, and they admit, the virus came out of a lab, a virology lab in Wuhan. I think it escaped accidentally. I don't think they intended to let it escape at that time, though possibly later they would have. But once it got out accidentally, because the communists had very poor safety standards in these labs, as is typical of anything run by a communist government. What happened then was they saw the opportunity to use it. And what happened? They locked down the rest of China from Wuhan, but they continued to allow it to be taken out around the world by airplanes. And uh, what did they do? They infected the world by protecting themselves. Now, that was purposeful. That was because China wants to become the dominant economy in the world by the year 2040. And they will do anything and everything. They will lie, steal, cheat, and infect to meet that goal. Because that's what communists do. And that's very, very sad indeed. Terrible. Um, now, a quick one here. It says, Doctor, do you think that this vaccine is a mark of the beast since the government are looking to make, ta uh, to make taking it compulsory? If you don't take it, you won't be able to travel. And in some cases, you won't be able to work. I'm very concerned about what to do. Regards, Patrick. Well, to, to the best of my knowledge at the moment, it's not mandatory, but it's certainly being highly promoted. Uh, I am concerned that it would become mandatory, of course. And I mentioned earlier, I think this is a matter of personal conscience, whether you take it or not. I think you do need to take a look at the risks and the rewards. Again, are, are you willing to balance surviving COVID-19 because you got the vaccine? Are you willing to risk your life if you get COVID-19, you're going to perish? I mean, there's a cost and effect basis that everybody has to make for themselves as far as I'm concerned. Uh, if it became mandatory, I would be against it, period. Thank you for that. That's beautiful. Well, we've got just about a minute and a half to go. I just want to give you about a minute for your final thoughts, sir. Well, I do want to point out that, again, scientifically, we will always find COVID-19. Every time you test for something, you will find it. The only time that you will stop finding it is if you stop testing for it. But the, for, most people, for most people, this is not a big problem. It is for those that are vulnerable, and we should protect them first. And isn't it interesting that some of the most liberal people in round, such as the governor of New York, not only sent people back into places where they would become infected, but now promotes sending people to infect others. Well, on that note, I really want to thank you so much. Several questions here from our viewers, but I know that you'll be coming back again very, very soon to share with us. Um, 